My message uh, today is uh, being about my father's business. How many remember the story in the New Testament that this phrase is from? Uh, do we have a few that remember? <clears throat> well, uh, this is actually the, the words of Jesus, but not as an adult, as a 12-year-old boy. And so we are looking uh, today at uh, Luke, the book of Luke, that recounts the story. And I'm going to read it for you from beginning to end so you can uh, get a clear picture of what was happening. Uh, and this is all about today being about our father's business. So the boy Jesus is at the temple is where this story begins. And this is Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 41. Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. So they were traveling in a large group, probably. Verse 45 goes on to say, when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, can you imagine? Your child is lost for three days. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him, heard Jesus, was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And she might have said, and for three days, and you are so grounded. That's not really what happened. But. Why were you searching for me, Jesus says, this little 12-year-old kid. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Or another translation is dealing with the things of my father, or the King James Version says, or about my father's business. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. So I would like to pose the question as I began my message this morning, what does it mean to be about our father's business? What does it mean to be dealing with the things of our father? We certainly see in this story where Jesus being about his father's business and dealing with the things of his father created real upset and even chaos in the life of Mary and Joseph. We are very familiar in our culture today with Amber Alerts, and we are also uh, very aware of what it might feel like as a parent to have your child go missing. And especially three days missing, you would have to have sleepless nights and be in utter anguish over the fact that you don't know where your child is. I am sure that Mary and Joseph were very, very fearful and didn't know where their son was. I think that probably that culture might not be as mean and and vile as our culture today, I don't know for sure, but I think it's probably more technology and, and uh, guns and things to, that might suggest that if our child has been missing for three, three days, there might be something very much amiss that could include uh, even the death of our child since we couldn't find them. But in this case, I don't know if that's exactly what they were feeling, but we do know that any parent who has lost a child is frantically looking and hoping that they will be able to find that child again. So I want to look today in this message about uh, and, and point to contrasting realities. So Jesus is in the temple with the teachers, 12 years old, and to the amazement of those listening, he is speaking to them. There is an exchange, there is a dialogue, and Jesus is talking well beyond his years. He was speaking, no doubt, with rabbis who were, uh, who were uh, steeped in the law and knew the law. And so here this 12-year-old boy, who would have probably started learning about the Torah and learning about uh, maybe receiving instruction from a rabbi about this age or a little before, but at this point he is being more the teacher than, than, uh, than the student. 
And so people are absolutely amazed listening to him. And even when his parents walk in and find him, they are astonished at what they see. It's really a very positive and very powerful image that this young boy is speaking to rabbis and exchanging information, and everyone in the room is astonished and amazed at what is taking place. The contrasting reality is panicked parents. In reality, there was nothing wrong with Jesus. In reality, when you step back at the situation and you look after it's all over with, you see that Jesus was very safe. He was never in any danger. He was in with in the synagogue with responsible people, and there was something really powerful going on on in the spiritual realm. And yet, this other contrasting reality that's also very honest and very real and very powerful is parents who don't know what is going on, and they're they're frightened to death of what might have come with their son or what have happened to their son. Being about your father's business, the first thing that we might say about it this morning, is it's going to create chaos to those who are not sharing kingdom reality. It's very possible that when we are steeped in the reality of the kingdom, that there's going to be chaos, even perhaps related to what we are involved in and what we are doing, that has nothing to do with what we're doing. But there are two contrasting realities here, and we choose which one we will be a part of. Any responsible parent knows that you must do what you must do to find a child that's gone missing. But we can learn something from this story to realize that as we are adults and we are Christians on the path of trying to understand and and develop mature faith, that we don't have to buy into the chaos because there's always something kingdom present that's bringing truth and reality to our situation. And we don't have to buy into the chaos. I want to talk again about or bring three other examples of contrasts in uh, reality this morning out of biblical scriptures. Uh, Chaos and calm are the two categories. So what is the death of Lazarus? And we're familiar with this story, I suppose most of us. And we realize that Jesus is, is outside Jerusalem. In fact, he's a three days journey outside Jerusalem. And he's with his disciples and he's getting ready to go back to Jerusalem. And so on their way there, Jesus has this conversation with his disciples, and he tells them, oh, by the way, our friend Lazarus, he has fallen asleep. And so I'm sure the disciples were thinking, well, good for Lazarus. He must have been tired, so he's laid down for a nap. And Jesus clarifies, I'm not talking about natural sleep. I'm telling you that Lazarus has died. Three days before they get arrived there, Jesus is aware that Lazarus has, dead, has died and is dead. So now we have one reality where Jesus is aware of this, Jesus who has the power to do miracles beyond human imagination, and he knows his purpose in going back to Jerusalem is going to address the chaos of the situation that has been created out of the death of Lazarus. But he also knows that there is chaos going on as a result of the the death of Lazarus. And Jesus tells his disciples, I'm glad that I'm here with you, and I wasn't there to see this because you're going to realize, my followers, that I did not have this information ahead of time, and it's going to underscore this kingdom reality that is present with you in me. That's what Jesus was basically saying. So Jesus arrives, and Mary and Martha, the two sisters of their brother Lazarus, are frantic, and they run to Jesus, and they said, Oh, Jesus, if you had just been here three days ago, our brother would not have died. And Jesus responds to them and says, Your your brother will live again. And these people were people of faith, and so they said, yes, we know that he will live again in the resurrection, but if you had been here, you could have prevented his death. And of course, Jesus knew what he was about to do, but no one else did. And by that time, there was a a group of people who had gathered, and they were all weeping and mourning. And in in, uh, the scripture, it even here says that Jesus wept. 
I don't know specifically why Jesus was crying. I can guarantee you it wasn't over the loss of Lazarus per se because he was getting ready to raise Lazarus from the dead. And so that was not the issue. I have a feeling, and this is conjecture on my part, but I believe that Jesus being touched by the feeling of people's infirmities, that he was feeling the pain of the people caused by the death of Lazarus, his friend. I'm sure that Lazarus was too young to die. He was not infirmed or sick in any way, and I think it must have been a surprise to everyone. And everyone in the region that was friends with his family had gathered, and they were mourning the loss. He had already been wrapped in grave clothes, and he had already been placed in the tomb, and now it's four days later. And I just remembered I need to go back and correct something. They were not three days' journey away. They waited. Jesus waited three days before they started back because he knew that this was going to be an opportunity for him to perform a miracle again. And so the reality of the situation, though, is we have people who are mourning and grieving appropriately because of the loss of someone they loved. And then we have Jesus who is living in this calm and even affecting his trip back to be delayed to where it will be after the death and after the burial of 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 Lazarus, his friend. And then he comes back into the situation. It's another example where when we look at the human realm, we understand chaos and we understand grieving and loss and how it turns our world upside down. But Jesus was not grieving. And Jesus was living in a kingdom reality that allowed him to walk into this situation and bring hope to his sisters and hope to the people that were there uh, to observe his death. Hope to those who were mourning the loss of his death, of, of, of Lazarus. And now Jesus comes to bring life. From one moment to the next, all of the chaos of the human situation was turned to rejoicing because Jesus brought the kingdom mentality and reality into this chaotic human situation. The lesson that we take away from this story and the other two stories I will talk about this morning is that there is always chaos around us. There are always very natural responses from a human perspective. We grieve when someone dies. We are frightened when a child is lost. But we should never enter into those experiences without the hope of the kingdom that brings us back to planet Earth as far as our feet go and allows our mind to be at rest and engage in the peace of Christ that is beyond human comprehension. That's exactly what the scripture says, that the peace surpasses human understanding. The human understanding in Lazarus is he's dead. The peace that passes the reality of that understanding is that Jesus is the resurrection and he is the life and he's bringing life back into this scenario. And that same truth and reality is here for you and I today. No matter what the external circumstances is, it may be or are, it may be as concrete as somebody laying in a casket and buried in the ground, but the kingdom has not been diminished. The reality is still the reality of the kingdom. The next story that I want to look at is the storm uh, in a boat on the lake. Another familiar story that's in the gospel. We've got Jesus, who's on the the large boat, all the disciples are on the large boat as well. And what is happening? There's a huge storm. How many have ever been on a a boat or a ship in a storm, other than a big cruise liner? Has anybody ever been in a kind of a smaller boat, and the waves are doing this, and you're like, oh, no. (laughs) uh, I used to go deep sea fishing with my dad. We even did, um, like we do half day uh, fishing excursions, but a couple times I did a full day and then a three day where we were actually out on the boat for three days, spent the night some. And so I've uh, been in in situations where, wow, you know, I feel the water move under my feet instead of the earth. And it's, uh, if uh, if you have any sense of um, seasickness or motion sickness at all, it's a problem, believe me. I uh, learned uh, what medications to take to avoid that right away. But when you're in a storm and you're on a boat, you feel very vulnerable. 
And this storm was so bad that the disciples were afraid for their lives. They thought that it was very possible that the storm was going to overtake the boat, the boat was going to sink, and they were all going to drown and die there. That was the reality of chaos. And what was Jesus doing? Sleeping. He's exactly right. He was sleeping. He was not disturbed. There was no chaos surrounding him. He was very calm. And why do you think that is? Because he knew there was no real danger of drowning. It wasn't even on his, in his mind. There was no thought of it. Do you see how we so engage in the human thinking processes that we totally eliminate the supernatural power of Christ that lives within us every moment of every day. We automatically go to the worst uh, conclusion to a scenario, thinking, oh, we're going to die and drown because of this horrible storm. Well, they didn't. It was another display of the miraculous power of Christ when he stood up and said, peace, be still. And the storm immediately stopped. The waters were calm. And the disciples asked this question, Who is this man that even the winds and the sea obey him? Do you know who is living inside of you today as a believer? And you may say, well, Pastor Dan, I'm not a very good believer. I keep making mistakes and I keep doing things that I really think that I probably shouldn't do. But do you know that the kingdom of God is, is compared to this power that is placed inside human temples or earthen vessels of clay, one writer says in the New Testament, and it's to contrast and it's to show that the power that is Jesus is not the same thing as you and I. It is different from you and I. And thank God that it is, because if it wasn't different from you and I, we would have a reality of chaos to live in. It doesn't matter what The chaotic situation is we have the kingdom dwelling within us and we can have the same peace within us that enabled Jesus to lay down and sleep in a storm, that enabled Jesus to rest a couple of more days before he decided to get to the burial place of Lazarus, his friend. God does not want human beings to live in chaos, but it's everywhere, isn't it? It's everywhere. Just turn on the news. The third story is Samaritan opposition. On the way back now, in the same uh, chapter, the disciples and Jesus are bypassing Samaria, and they're going back to Jerusalem, probably a trip they took more than a few times in their three years of ministry together. And the disciples are hearing some Samaritans uh, criticize the disciples and Jesus. So... You've heard me say before that Samaritans didn't like Jews and Jews didn't like Samaritans. It's because Samaritans were half Gentile and half Jewish. So Jews hated Samaritans because of that. They had disobeyed the Old Testament law. They had gone off there. There was a whole city of them. And when the uh, Samaritans realized that these were Jewish men that were walking by, they were shouting out insults and shouting out profanity probably and just saying horrible things about them. And you know what the, the godly spiritual disciples said? Jesus, call down fire from heaven and kill these people. Burn them up. That was their response. Not very loving, is it? They felt as though because they were being attacked and they were being insulted by this Samaritan opposition, that the righteous indignation of of the kingdom would rise and destroy them. But it tells us, it's another plain example, is that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. Jesus didn't come to to bring fire out of heaven and destroy people because of their profanity and because of their insults, even when they are to Christ himself. He He was not about that. The reality of chaos in this situation was insults and injury from people who had a perspective that was anything but the kingdom. And even the disciples bought into it, and there was this this tit-for-tat, and probably screaming back and forth, and and the disciples just thought, you know, Jesus, kill them all. Jesus isn't about killing unworthy people. He's about saving unworthy people. He's about extending his love to us and to the Samaritans who are screaming at us in 
and his story. So angry judgment is the chaos and steadfast direction is the calm. It did not thwart Jesus' efforts to go on to Jerusalem. He went on and he, I'm sure he rebutted, rebutted the, the, the efforts of his own disciples that was asking him to do something that was not the right thing, calling fire from heaven. We constantly are living with chaos around us and calm around us, and we choose what we embrace. We choose what becomes the fodder of our minds, the material that we dwell on. And you know something? If you get up and you're focusing on the weeping and the mourning and the fear and the panic and the anger and the judgment, that's how your day goes. And do you know, and if you don't, I want to let you know today that when we are walking confidently, uh, calmly, and directed instead of in the weeping in the morning, and we get up and rise from our, from our uh, slumber at night, and we approach the day with control over the elements and also being steadfast in our direction, our day will be different. We will live with the hope of the kingdom that dwells within us. And that's what Jesus came to give each, of us, each and every one of us. Now, you may say, well, Pastor Dan, there's a lot of cause for chaos today. I just hit a few. My goodness, I could have had 50 slides on this one. Fiscal cliff. Are you tired, kind of tired of hearing about the fiscal cliff? I have heard uh, Greenspan talk about the crystal, fiscal, fiscal cliff. <laughs> say that fast three times. <laughs> Uh, this last week in a CNN interview, and, and he says, you know, I really don't think anything's going to happen. If we, end up not going, if we end up going over the cliff for a little while, it's like the world is not going to come to an end. We had the Great Depression in 29, and some people are jumping out windows. I'm kind of filling in the blanks. He didn't say all this, but the reality is that when financial crisis came in the Great Depression, literally people were jumping out of windows, some of them, because they lost everything. You know what that means? That means that their whole life was wrapped in their money. And if your whole life is gone because it's wrapped in your money, you're going to jump out of a window if you lose it all. But if your whole life is wrapped in the kingdom reality of God, you will not jump out of the window when all of your money is gone. You're going to say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes, and blessed is the name of the Lord, whether he's giving or whether he's going to take it. You're going to rise to another day to have confidence and faith to believe that you're going to overcome the Great Depression. Maybe your depression is a different type of depression. You wake up and you just don't want to get out of bed because you're depressed. There are people who are clinically depressed, who take medication for depression. There are other people who just, their mood swings happen all the time. And all of us deals with feeling low, feeling down, and sometimes being depressed. I believe that there's a certain amount of that that we can ri allow the kingdom reality to rise within our beings, can become the focal point of our lives as we go about our day, and we don't have to always give in to those lower vibrations, if you will, that pull us down. The fiscal cliff, I, I've heard some people say it's going to be catastrophic, and other people say, eh, it's, we'll never even know the difference. We've survived worse than this. Severe escalation of an unstable Middle East. I guess you're all aware of what's going on in, in the Gaza Strip between Israel and the Palestinians. Frightening <laughs> in a very natural sense. Talk about chaos. It's, it's a picture that defines chaos. Um, severe escalation. 7.9 unemployment nationwide is current, is a very current figure. Bloomberg reports that social security war, uh, woes are worse than you think. How many are getting close to retirement? You're thinking about that. Foreclosure up 47% in March of this year from a year ago and up 7% from last month alone based on reality track stati statistics. There are all kinds of reasons for us to be fearful and worried and feel the chaos of our environment today. So what does it mean to be about our Father's business? What does it mean to deal with the things of our Father? It means to live in God reality, not in human reality. I want to read first or 2 Corinthians that tells us the world is unprincipled. 
I don't have to convince anybody of that. It's a dog, it's a dog eat dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair, but we don't live or fight our battles that way, never have and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing that entire massively corrupt culture. It goes on. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience unto maturity. This was Paul's words and writing to the church at Corinth. So the struggle that we face is not against flesh and blood. The war that we are in doesn't have to do with picking up a gun and, and getting rid of the uh, offender. Struggle is not against flesh and blood, blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So the things that we battle are not really material at all. It's here. It's the spiritual realm. And God has given us a set of tools that will enable us to deal with this realm and also win over the battle against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, and the spiritual forces of the evil in heavenly realms that affects our minds more than anything else. And we are told that we have a protective armor in what we, what we access for tools to help us overcome the difficulty of life. Put on the full armor of God, Ephesians says, and this is again the writings of Paul, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to remain standing. After it all happens, you're still standing. David talks in the Psalms about 10,000 may fall at my left and 1,000 may fall at my right, but I will remain standing because I am God's child. And that is exactly the truth with us today. We are the ones who will remain standing as we stand in faith, no matter who falls to the left and who falls to the right, when we have this protective armor on. And what is the armor? It is the truth. We live and speak truth. We don't deal in false, falseness. We, we live in truth. And that is a journey. As life goes by, we find that we are embracing truth with our faith and, and other things just don't apply anymore. What is false doesn't even stick anymore. It becomes less meaningful to us. Rightness or righteousness. And do you know that God provides this righteousness? It's like you, you place on a garment, clothing yourself with the goodness of God, with the rightness of God. This is provided by God. It's not even something we do for ourselves. This is part of the, the tools that we carry with us to win against this battle that we are in of our mind provided by God, rightness, living right, and then peace, which is a product of trusting God, as was illustrated in the story of the storm. And Jesus illustrated the peace in all four of the scenarios that I've talked about so far this morning. Faith, that again is provided by God. Every human being, according to James, is given a measure of faith or the measure of faith. It's there within us. God has given us everything to succeed in this. And then salvation, which again is a gift from God. It's not something that we earn. It's not something that we can get by doing a combination of things. It is the free gift of God that he gives to us. And then the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now I want you to notice about these six things that are listed here. There's nothing tangible here. There's no physical physicality to these six topics or these six items, truth and righteousness and peace, faith, salvation, and the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is something that protects us from every evil thing that is happening around us. 
So we don't have to buy into the panic and the chaos of everything that is around us because we are living in truth. And what is the truth? That none of this can touch us. None of this can destroy us. The love of God can't be separated from us by any of the, the natural things in life. Not health, not sickness, not, not goodness, not, not anything. Can, nothing can separate us from the, the love of God, says uh, Romans, um, the writing of Paul again. And so being about our Father's business, this is a summation of what it means. Being about our Father's business is living aware of God moment by moment, always understanding that even if there's chaos, the presence of God is there as Jesus was present in the death of Lazarus, as Jesus was present and bringing hope and healing in that situation, as Jesus stayed the course when Samaritans were being offensive. In all situations that you and I face, we have the option of remaining calm and trusting and being about our Father's business by being aware of his presence moment by moment. Jesus physically, as a 12-year-old, walked to a synagogue and he was in the midst of conversation that was about the truth of the kingdom. You don't have to be in a physical church for that to happen because we have the reality and the truth of that experience that Christ had within us. And so we take it with us everywhere we go. Being about our Father's business will make visible the contrast or the chaos of, uh, of worldviews, the contrast between worldviews and God view, and how that uh, incredibly affects the choices that we make and our calm and our peace in the midst of trial. Being about our Father's business will expose the futility of human manip manipulation. It's like human ma manipulation can be compared to rearranging chairs on the Titanic. That's a common phrase. What, def what difference does it matter? Human manipulation means little or nothing related to the kingdom. Being about our Father's business will give us tools to be like Christ in obedience and maturity. Being about our Father's business will dissolve every weapon that is formed against us and will establish in us truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, the Spirit which is the Word of God. My challenge to you today as the worship team returns to the stage is that we would become more Christ-minded through all of the challenges of life, that we would be more aware of all that God is calling us to in the way of our thinking, because this is where the battle is, friends. Talk to anybody about no matter what their problems are, it starts right here, and most of the time it ends right here in our thinking. And God is calling us. He has provided for us the peace that is beyond human comprehension, and it's up to us to cultivate that peace and to keep the other things out and away from us that rob us from the peace. Why don't you stand as we sing our prayer?